Well, this morning, I think I've already told you, we are looking at the entire passage, uh, but we're not going to go through it with a fine-tooth comb, obviously, in the brief amount of time that we have. But we are building up to the climax, and the climax is given to us in verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 10, which uh, I'll, I'll just simply read in the context, verses 31 through 33. Paul writes, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. You know, we see in, in the heart of the, um, of the Apostle Paul, the same heart obviously we see in our Lord Jesus Christ, but also in George Whitfield. Uh, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Apostle Paul, I said Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, <laughs> they all had this in common. They wanted to glorify the Lord with their lives, and that's what our Lord calls us to do. Now, in our passage, uh, Paul is warning the Corinthians against the sin of idolatry, which is against giving the honor the worship that rightfully belongs to God to someone or something other than Him. Our Lord tells us in the first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And that essentially means whether it be a false god or whether it be a person or whether it be a thing, that, that we devote ourselves to that thing, whatever it is, more than we devote ourselves to God. Whatever we love the most, whatever we're seeking to please the most, that is our God. So we need to be careful we give that love and affection to God. Now, the worship of false gods, as I've already mentioned, was, was rife, widespread in Corinth. And Paul is writing to the Christians, telling them they need to avoid it. Now, you need to understand that this has the same application to us as it had to them. We may not necessarily be tempted by the idolatry that they were tempted by. I mean, they were tempted literally. There were, you know, there were temples built of false gods that they could worship. Paul addresses that, the Gentile sacrifice to, to demons. Now, we're not necessarily tempted to do that, although perhaps some of us may be because there are false gods and false worship still. But we can fall into this same sin, as I mentioned before, we do when we put anything in our hearts ahead of God, you know, of our love and our service to Him. We need to put Him first and serve Him first. Now, if we are true believers, this, you know, falling into sin, which we're liable to do, is something we cannot do consistently, even though we are liable to it. We can do it for a time. Paul is writing to Christians to warn them against doing this very thing. We have the possibility of backsliding, but this is something that if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot do continually. John tells us in 1 John 3, verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. And if we were to fall into idolatry, if, uh, if things, as it were, uh, ascend in our hearts that we begin to love them more than we love God, we will never allow ourselves to do this with a whole heart, that, as unbelievers would do, because we have God's Spirit working in us, and He is going to compel us to fight against the things that would usurp God's rightful place. Uh, the warnings that the Apostle Paul gives to us and other warnings in scriptures are meant to do exactly this, to get us to fight against sin, to agree with the Holy Spirit as he moves us in that direction. So Paul is warning us against idolatry because it's something that we are liable to fall into. Those true believers, we will not fall entirely away nor fully away because we have God's Spirit working in us. But I want you to notice here too that Paul is making an assumption that in this congregation in Corinth, as virtually in every congregation in the world from that time forward, that there is always going to be a mixed congregation. There are going to be those who belong to Jesus and those who don't. And I think that's the point behind what Paul is doing when he draws our attention 
to the Old Covenant church. He draws our attention to them in order to prove his point. They had the same privileges, essentially, that those at Corinth had, the same privileges that we have. Now, the difference between the privileges that they had and the privileges that we have are, th are basically this. The things they had were many pictures and promises that were pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, while ours, such as what we're doing here, we're talking about things that have happened. As we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, it, it points back to what Jesus did. Theirs were pointing forward to what He would do. But the point is, those things they had uh, could have saved them just as well as the things we have can save us if they look forward to Jesus in faith. Now again, what are some of those things? Paul points to them. God's having redeemed them out of Egypt. That great work of redemption in the Old Covenant was really a picture that was pointing to the redemption that the Lord would provide through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Christ. Remember it says in, um, in Hebrews, chapter, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 that Moses did not consider the, basically the role of Christ as something to be despised. He embraced that. He was the mediator. He was the Messiah for the children of Israel who brought them out of Egypt. Well, he was pointing to the greater Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would bring us out of the world. They were baptized in the wilderness. This water baptism in the cloud and in the sea was into Moses, the mediator of the Old Covenant, and it pointed forward to baptism, the baptism we would receive into the Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Covenant. It, it pointed to their need to be baptized into Christ. Paul says they ate spiritual food, the manna that God provided. Jesus pointed to that manna, and he says, I am the bread that comes down out of heaven that gives, you know, if a person eats from it, will give life to them. That manna was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true bread from heaven, and they drank spiritual drink, the water that came from the rock, and Paul tells us the rock was Christ. All of these things were pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and the spiritual meal that they enjoyed in the wilderness was pointing to Him, even as the spiritual meal that we enjoy from Lord's Day to Lord's Day, the Lord's Supper, is also pointing back to the Lord Jesus Christ. But even though they had all of these things, Paul is telling us, to point them to Jesus and to build them up in their faith, he says that most of them did not believe and they were laid low in the wilderness. And what he means by that was that they were destroyed in the wilderness by God's judgments. Now that raises an important question, and the question is this, if it's true that visible congregations of those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are a mixed bag, you know, there are some believers and some unbelievers, where do we stand with the Lord? Are we basing our hope of heaven on the same things that, that they perhaps were basing their hope of entering into the promised land and eventually into heaven on? That we believe in Jesus, that we believe that it's true, that He really exists, that He really is the Son of God, He really was crucified? Are we basing it on the fact that we're members of His church and that we've been baptized with water and that we participate in the Lord's Supper every week? If that's all we're basing our, our hope of heaven on, we can almost hear James say to us, as he said to those who were basing their salvation on works, oh, you do all these things? You do well. But I want you to recognize that those who died in the wilderness did exactly the same thing that you're doing. You see, you need more. You need more than this. You need more than what they had, more than what they did. And the question is, what more do we need? Well, Paul tells us, as also James tells us, that we need the evidence of a transformed life, that these things aren't just outside of us, but have affected our hearts. They have transformed us. So what are those evidences? Well, we, there's one that basically summarizes all of them, and that is devotion to God. We need to be devoted to Him. We need to love Him. We need to be committed to Him to doing things His way, to seek His pleasure rather than 
our own pleasure. Now, I want you to notice, again, thinking back to the Jews who were in the wilderness, where did they go wrong? The Jews were following God, and they had all these privileges. Well, the thing is this. The Jews only followed God as long as he gave them what it is they wanted. And when they didn't give him or when he didn't give them what they wanted, they fell away. And that's essentially what, what Paul is pointing here. Now, they certainly loved him when he brought them out of Egypt. I mean, their life had been hard for many, many years. They were in slavery for 430 years. It was an iron furnace. It was one of the representations. Uh, Pharaoh made their lives miserable and difficult, and they were very happy when God brought them out. But as soon as he brought them out of Egypt and they were camped at the base of Mount Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law of God, well, when Moses took too long, the first thing they did was they turned back to their old, their old ways again. We read they made an image of Yahweh, the golden calf. They called that Yahweh, the covenant name of, of the God of Israel. And they worshiped the calf, the very thing that God was telling Moses, of course, that they must not do. They worshiped this calf, and they worshiped him in the way the Egyptians worshiped their gods, with feasting and with immorality. You know, they ate and drank, and they got up to play. And this, this idea of play is the idea of immorality. And they suffered for it. Many thousands were killed. When Balaam counseled Balak to uh, basically, uh, remember Balak hired Balaam to curse the, the children of Israel, and Balaam couldn't do it because every time he, he basically tried to, he said, I can only speak what God tells me, and God kept blessing them. Well, even though he couldn't do that, Balaam still told Balak how he could get God to destroy those people. And that's what Balak did. Balak sent his prostitutes to the men of Israel to invite them to come and worship their fertility gods, which they essentially do through sexual immorality, and they fell into idolatry again. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 23,000 of them died in one day. When they complained that the journey was, was taking too long, and the reason why it was taking so long was because they rejected God, wouldn't believe in God. God sentenced them to wander in the, for 40 years in the wilderness until that whole generation passed away, and they got tired of eating the food that God provided, the bread from heaven, the manna. God, they grumbled and complained. And so God sent fiery serpents among them that killed many of them. Now, the only ones who survived that particular judgment of God were those who looked to the bronze serpent that God told Moses to make and put on the staff. And he said, anyone who gets stung by the serpent and looks to that bronze serpent will be healed. And those who did were healed. They, that was God's mercy. And Jesus tells us that that bronze serpent was actually pointing to him. We're all stung by sin. We're all dying. We're all basically going to die and go down into hell, but God has provided His Son that if we just look to Him, we will have life. Jesus writes or basically says this in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. There was judgment, but there was always mercy mixed with judgment. There were those who survived, you see because of God's mercy. When the Jews thought that God was too restrictive as to who may be a priest and may not be a priest, as in the case of Korah and those who were with him, uh, who wanted to make their own rules and do things their own way, no, we, don't, we think that's unfair what God said, not just the sons of Aaron, but us as well. God said, this is how I'm going to respond to that. He sent his destroying angel. And the destroying angel brought fire from the tent of God that burned up all the men who were standing before him, doing things they shouldn't be doing. And a great earthquake opened up in the camp of Israel and swallowed their tents and everything that belonged to them. They went down alive into Sheol. Now again, they had all these privileges. What was the problem? They weren't devoted to God. They didn't want to do things God's way. They wanted to do them their own way. They wanted to serve and please themselves. Now, the point is, if we belong to Jesus, we will be content with what the Lord gives us. We will stick to doing things God's way. And we won't fall away so quickly 
when things don't go the way we want them to go. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted, that we're not going to be tempted to turn away from God to get what we want. It doesn't mean that we're not going to fall into sin because we know Christians are fallible. Remember David and his sin against Bathsheba, his essentially murdering Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's wife, think about, or Bathsheba's husband, think about uh, Peter and how he denied the Lord. But that's not going to be our lifestyle. That's not going to be the way we live. More often than not, we will, when presented with the opportunity to disobey, turn away from the Lord to get what we want, we will take the way out that God provides. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. With every temptation that comes our way, and they all come in God's plan, He's not inspiring the sin that's behind it, but in His plan, He is bringing it. God always brings a way to get out. We do not have to sin. If we belong to the Lord and are devoted to Him, more often than not, we're going to be taking that way out. And when we do fall, because we're not going to do it perfectly, not by any means, we won't stay in that sin, but we will get up and we will keep moving forward because we can't do otherwise. We are devoted to God. Paul tells us that if we are sharers in the table of the Lord, if we come here and eat the Lord's Supper week after week, this is what we must do. We must be devoted to Him. We must eat from His table alone which essentially means we must give ourselves completely to Him. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 21 through 22, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than He, are we? We can't have one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the world. We have to have both feet in God's kingdom. We need to be devoted to Him. That's the difference. Now, secondly, Paul tells us that we're not going to use even the freedoms that the Lord gives us in the kingdom of heaven to please ourselves, but rather to please Him, to honor Him, and to please others. Now, Paul told the Corinthians that they were not to eat from the table of demons, which means they were not to sacrifice to demons. You can't eat from their table and the table of the Lord as well. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of heaven. But he goes on to say in verse 23, as well as in, in the entirety of chapter 8 and chapter 9 of this book, that they may eat meat that is sacrificed to an idol. He says in verse 23, all things are lawful. And by the way, consider the context. Paul is not saying there's no law. And you can do whatever you want to do. Some people read this and they see it as a license to sin. That's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is it is lawful to eat all things. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful. But not all things edify or build up. And then he says in verses 25 and 26, eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. Where does that meat come from that's in the meat market in Corinth? It comes from the sacrifices that are going on in the pagan temples. But he says, eat it. It's okay. What Paul is telling us here is that there is a difference between sacrificing to an idol because you're showing your devotion to it and eating from that table and eating something that has been sacrificed to an idol while you are devoted to the Lord. And let me suggest it's the same difference between enjoying the things of this world, which the Lord has given to the people of this world, as one who is devoted to the world and who belongs to the world, wanting or seeking only their self-pleasure, what it is they want, what's good for them, or enjoying the things of the world as those who belong to the Lord, using these things to glorify Him. Now, the Corinthians had the freedom to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols as long as in eating it, they were seeking to please the Lord. Well, it didn't please him. 
if their eating of these things gave the unbeliever who invited them to a feast a reason to accuse them of hypocrisy. And it didn't please the Lord if in eating these things, if there was a weaker brother or sister who was present at this feast, that by your eating encouraged them to eat and to sin against their conscience and so sin against the Lord. We had to be careful. They had to be careful how they use these things. Now today, perhaps an example for us would be like drinking alcohol. You know, that's not, that's not a non-controversial matter. It's still controversial in, in certain places. And so we have to be careful how we handle that. Now, they had the, the freedom to eat meat sacrificed to idols. We have the freedom to drink alcohol if we use the alcohol as the Lord intends. But if we know that, that there's somebody present while we're drinking uh, who doesn't believe who will accuse us of being inconsistent Christians, who accuse us of being hypocritical Christians because he can't understand the difference between responsible drinking, drinking to the Lord's glory, not getting drunk, and drunkenness. Or if there happens to be a weaker brother who's present, who again, through our drinking, would encourage him to drink when he believes that all drinking is still wrong, then Paul says, don't use that freedom, but instead abstain from drinking. Yeah, don't destroy a brother. Don't stumble somebody from coming to Jesus for the sake of your pleasure. Use your freedom instead to help others. We need to be aware of how what we do with our liberties, how that affects other people. Paul says we need to be thinking more about the well-being of others than for our own pleasure, which is what Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians 10, Verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Now, here's, here's a very important principle because how often do we put this one into practice? This, this doesn't apply just to what I happen to be drinking or eating at a particular time, but it also applies to what I'm doing. You know, how is what I'm doing affecting other people? And is what I'm doing purely for my own pleasure? Or am I doing what I am doing in order to influence somebody else to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think oftentimes, especially in our culture with, our, you know, with the opportunities provided for us and the free time, we end up seeking our own good and don't often seek after the good of our neighbor. Now, the bottom line Paul gives to us in verse 31, the bottom line is this, that if we belong to Jesus, then we are to devote ourselves to him. And that means that we will be careful to do everything that we do, not for our pleasure, but rather for His pleasure, for His glory, for His honor. That's what Paul means when he says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, that's clearly what Jesus did. If I were to ask you, was Jesus seeking His own pleasure when He was in this world? Now, when I say that, Remember, he, he did take pleasure in what he was doing. When he served his father and did his father's will, that brought him a great deal of joy and pleasure. So in a certain sense, yes, he was seeking his pleasure, but he wasn't seeking it in the way we usually think of it, right? Doing things that just basically had his own pleasure in view. His pleasure was giving the father pleasure. Is that what the Apostle Paul did? How did he live? Do you see him basically pampering himself and doing things to just enjoy life himself. No, he was doing the things that he did in order to glorify the Lord. And what is it that made the difference in George Whitfield's life? I mean, why was he so industrious? Why was he able to do so much? Well, one of the reasons was because everything he did, he was aiming to the glory of God. Now, if we have God's Spirit within us, that's also what we are going to find ourselves doing if we belong to the Lord. This is what makes the difference between those who died in the wilderness because they were seeking their own things and not God's pleasure and those who will inherit heaven. Now, this, this principle of giving glory to God in all things is essentially what the Christian life is all about. You know, we, we were talking about five uh, solas of the Reformation, remember? Remember? 
We're talking about how we're, you know, we, we use the Bible alone as our authority. We were saved by God's grace alone. It's a free gift. It's received by faith alone so that it might be a free gift. Uh, salvation is accomplished by Jesus alone. But remember the last one, sola deo gloria. God alone gets all the glory. We need to give him the credit for his work of salvation. But as Dr. Nichols pointed out to us, uh, sola deo gloria means more than simply giving God the credit for our salvation. Thanks, God. Thanks for saving me. And now I'm going to go about and do my own thing. I want to live the way I'm going to live and, and whoop it up. No. Sola Dei Gloria means now I devote my life solely to the glory of God. My decisions are based upon whether or not what I am doing is pleasing to Him or not pleasing to Him. I begin to live as Jesus lived. That is the difference, you see. So it's important that we understand what it means to give glory to God. We've seen just one example of it here in how we, uh, how we handle those things that have been sacrificed to idols, how we use our liberty as Christians. But it's much more encompassing than that, so this evening we are going to focus a little bit more on how to live for God's glory. So I would encourage you uh, to come back this evening for that. But let's remember, particularly as we're moving now into the Lord's Supper, that if we are going to eat from this table, that means that we have to be devoted to this table. We have to be devoted to the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord and idols. We can't eat from this table and the table of the world. We have to be exclusively the Lord's. And so that's what I'm going to ask us as we prepare to come to the table to think about. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talks about that we are to do this to remember what Jesus has done for us. He devoted himself to his Father's glory. He served him with everything that was within him in order to save us. And having saved us, he wants us now to live for his glory. We need to remember that. And we also need to remember if we come to the table on any other terms, then our desire to give ourselves fully to the Lord, then God's going to discipline us for that. If he loves us at all, he will discipline us for that, and he will bring us to the point where we will give ourselves to him in that way. So as we bow for just a moment of prayer, let's, um, let's purpose in our hearts again to give ourselves to the Lord in this way, that we are going to be his. We're going to be devoted to him. We're going to do it the way he tells us to do it, and we're going to do it because we love him. Let's, uh, let's take just a few moments in prayer, shall we? And, and then we'll celebrate the table.